This is part two of leveraging examples in e-learning. We will now uh, talk about the learning objective of ways to extend worked examples, starting with adding self-explanation questions. One of my favorite principles, self-explanation, super powerful. It works especially well for learning skills, whether they're skills in science and math or technology or interpersonal skills like there's a great study about learning how to do negotiation using self-explanation it's really powerful not good for facts um, and and not good for highly uh, holistic kinds of problem uh, memory uh, activities but it is good for more discrete knowledge components or ideas skills um, that you can explain in simple principles. And so, you know, we're back to our example from probability. It's a worked example, right? And this is just showing the first step, but rather than just having the students study it, there's an active component where the student is asked, please enter the number, the letter of the print rule slash principle used in this step. So they're given four rules or principles. There's some prior instruction about those uh, rules and principles like a, um, a lecture or a text describing those four principles. Uh, but here they have to decide themselves which one of those principles is applicable here. And it's the probability of an event. So if they type in A, they'll get uh, positive feedback. If they type in B or C or D, they'll get uh, negative feedback. And hopefully there'll be good explanatory feedback saying why this isn't an an instance of the principle of complementarity. And this prompting for self-explanation is a great way to help learners uh, engage in examples more deeply. Sometimes they, they, they process them more shallowly. So this prompts them to think about what is the reasoning behind each step. And this is uh, good for both engaging more uh, relevant cognitive load because they're asked to think about what's going on here, as well as having students think more generatively about how to do this on their own. At the same time, because there's a worked example here, it takes away the load of the doing and puts more of the student's effort on figuring out why. This works too in this uh, another context like this interpersonal context, this uh, uh, consulting scenario. Uh, so here, you know, the video stopped at some point and the student trainee learning about to be a consultant like Alicia has asked in this, in this instance, why is it important to verbally recap the doctor's questions about contraindications? And they click on this and they get feedback. Um, we're seeing menu-based uh, self-explanation responses. There can be open-ended self-explanation responses, and sometimes that can be more generative for students. But as a matter of uh, fact, the, lots of instances showing that these menu-based, or I sometimes call them selection-based, because they're, they're, there's often many more choices than in a typical menu. I'll show you an example of that in part three of this lecture. These selection-based have benefits because they, they embed instruction in, as, the, as the students read the choices they're learning about the principles, um, but they have to make the decision about which applies. So they're actively engaged in doing the mapping. But the second reason this is beneficial is they get immediate feedback when they enter it. So if, they're self, if their self-explanation is wrong, they get an opportunity to hear the right explanation and correct that. In open-ended self-explanation, that's harder to do. The student's not gonna get, unless there's natural language understanding uh, built into the system, uh, they're not gonna get feedback on whether their explanation is right or wrong. So is it effective? Yeah, it's super effective. You get better learning with self-explanation questions added. Um, lots of studies have been done, but when there are questions there as uh, prompting for self-explanations as compared to worked examples with no questions. Um, you get better uh, learning. Atkinson showed in this particular experiment being illustrated in this graph, but there have been a number of studies along these lines. We, we did some in our geometry cognitive tutor that'll show you a related example of later. So you can extend worked examples by self-explanation prompts, super powerful. You can also apply the multimedia principles, which you may have heard of elsewhere. They're uh, discussed in the same Clark and Mayer book. 
Now let me give you an example of a study of multimedia applied to worked examples that was done with student teachers. Um, so the student teachers were being taught how to make information meaningful to their students. Um, and, you know, you can imagine some lecture or text material, some, you know, here are recommendations for how to make information meaningful to students. But in this case, we're not talking about general uh, uh, abstract recommendations. We're going to see an example of a real teacher doing that. And the example may come in text, video, or animation. So the example in text doesn't implement the multimedia principle, which says add visuals, relevant visuals to your text, right? So that's the control condition. Two multimedia principle applications, one where the visuals are actual videos of classrooms, which you can imagine have real benefits for their realism. Others are animations, which you can imagine as a developer has the advantage that you can, you can create an animation that efficiently uh, illustrates the uh, learning goal that you want to be illustrated in a way that, you know, collecting real video can be hard to do. So in this research, um, as described here, you can read that on your own, uh, but they, they get a pretest on the goals here about meaningfulness, and then they experience this instruction, and then they get a post-test, and here we're showing the post-test scores. And you can see the two conditions that implement multimedia that add some realistic visuals to it produce significantly better learning than the examples without multimedia and which appear to be better than no examples at all. But this illustrates that worked examples can be improved by incorporating visuals and applying the multimedia principle. Uh, note, by the way, that another alternative essentially in between these two is well-chosen still photographs. Um, so there's no visual at all here. It's possible that those would be just as good as the video or animation. And in a different context, in a different domain, uh, there is research showing that those stills are just as effective as video and animation. It may not always be true, but in that, that's what they found in their context. In addition to the multimedia principle itself, there are five other multimedia principles, contiguity, multiality, and redundancy are some of them. And so here's another example where we have some text um, in these boxes um, that's describing an image, this graph, um, and it's that the learning goal is about learning to interpret a graph to find temperature differences on different days. And the worked example here is walking through how you read the graph. You select a time, you locate the two dots, and you get their values, and then you subtract. Um, Monday is, what, four degrees warmer than Tuesday. So spatial contiguity suggests that the text should be close to what is described, and that is applied in this case. This text is right here pointing exactly to it. Temporal contiguity is that there's a pointer like I'm using here, right? Um, that points to relevant things um, as the audio is talking about those relevant things. So I'm illustrating temporal contiguity right here in this uh, graph interpretation context. You know, we don't see any audio, but if there was audio and the person was pointing as I did, then that would be an application of temporal contiguity. The modality principle says that the Words describing an image should come in audio so the, st so the student's attention can be focused on the image, uh, their visual attention, while their ears and their auditory memory, the memory for sounds, can be focused on the words. Um, there should be minimal words on the screen, which is the case here, and the longer description comes in audio. It's tempting to think that maybe audio and the full text would be good, but the redundancy principle says no. It's better if the, uh, the fuller version of the words is only in audio. You can add some words, uh, and uh, particularly in the context of worked examples, some words that might prompt for self-explanation would be uh, particularly useful. Another one of the multimedia principles is called personalization, which is connecting to the learner. Uh, in this case, one example of that is making the connection through more familiar content. So imagine we're teaching teachers about learning goals or teaching instructional designers about learning goals and like in backward design. Um, using an example about a familiar context like brushing teeth uh, will make that kind of connection using an example from, I don't know, from uh, relativity and physics might not be a good way to 
get the point because the unfamiliar content will distract from the key point about, well, why is this a good learning objective? And notice that here we're talking about the learner and, and what activities we can observe to suggest that they will be better. And there is under what conditions and to what degree will they be able to demonstrate this objective. So it's a nice learning example of a good learning objective. So finally, extending worked examples can be done uh, by using variation and comparison. So variation and comparison are both good things to help enhance the amount of generalization that the learner might get from the instruction such that they might not only be able to solve highly related routine tasks, so that's uh, near transfer, they might also be able to solve much more different problem solving tasks that, that aren't exactly the same, uh, sorry, not as analogous to uh, the original examples given. And so the idea with variation is by introducing a lot of variability already, the student will be better prepared to go into a novel situation and exhibit further transfer. So let's, let's look at an example here um, that is uh, implementing some of these things. Uh, we'll review some of the other things before getting back to variation. So in this lesson, you will watch a video of a sales call to Dr. G. So you watch a video of a sales call. So this is, again, the drug sales consultant is going to provide a worked example here. Then you'll have a chance to work with two sales calls, one with help and one on your own. So there are now some practice, right, with other folks, right? So what do we have? We have a worked example where you watch a call, it fades, um, the worked example fades where you start to do it. And there's variation. So each of these doctors, Dr. G, Dr. Jones, Dr. Valdez, are going to provide some variations that will challenge the sales consultant um, in terms of their knowledge of the appropriate interpersonal interactions they should have with doctors. So this kind of variation of examples with different contexts, different numbers, if it's in math or science, really does help. But there is a possibility of too much variation that has occurred in, in, in some domains. But in general, uh, having variation within the same theme is, enhances learning. In addition to variation, another thing you can do to enhance uh, variation of examples is to prompt for comparison. So here's a study which gave some variation. So here's two different contexts, uh, working example, one's in a shipping context, one's in a travel context. They're separated, right? As an alternative condition, uh, an instructional condition, here we have the two examples given at the same time, inviting the student to compare these two examples. And in the third instructional condition in this study, in addition to having them together, there's a question, a set of questions that ask the student explicitly what's similar about the travel and shipping example. How do they illustrate the same underlying idea? Uh, so what happens to learning when we do comparison with an implicit indication by showing two examples together versus a more explicit one. This active comparison, these questions are basically, this is comparison with self-explanation. You're prompting the student to explain what's similar about these two different examples. So active comparison, comparison with self-explanation leads to the biggest learning outcomes and they're statistically different and better than the other cases. Comparison is beneficial. Um, you know, having varied multiple cases seems to be good here um, and having no training at all is worse, but this active comparison is particularly powerful. So worked examples are good. They can be made even better by prompting students to self-explain, by applying multimedia principles in the design of them, by having a varied set of examples and problems, and by suggesting the learner uh, compare and maybe even self-explain uh, what their judgments about the comparison are, what similarities do they see about across examples of the same idea.